What's up fellow gamers, Freak here with a video about killing an early inhibitor. So I've seen the topic of killing an early inhibitor brought up before. Full disclosure, I actually came into this project before the research uh, firmly on the side of being scared to death of killing an early inhibitor for fear of throwing the game. So there's always a chance that my interpretations are biased here. Why should people even be afraid of killing an inhibitor? Isn't the map pressure good? Let's break it down into components. By killing an inhibitor, you spawn super minions in that lane. They are incredibly durable, they give fellow minions 35 armor and magic resist, and they also deal tons of damage. This means they will take farm from allied champions, and the minion wave will push on its own, meaning your opponents can safely farm that lane from base, and it's not so easy for your team to do the same. All in all, a dead inhibitor spawns 8 waves with super minions, which after adding in the melee and range minions, maths out to 1560 gold and 3128 experience for your opponents to farm in that lane over those 4 minutes. While the value of cannon and thus super minions scales from 60 gold at the start of the game to 90 gold at about 17 minutes, any reasonable inhibitor kills coming well after that gold scaling is maxed out, which is how we landed on 1560. The rate of cannon spawns also changes. Beyond 15 minutes, cannons now spawn every second wave instead of every third, and after 25 minutes, they spawn every wave. The difference between four cannons on one side and eight super minions for an inhibitor kill on the other in that 15 and 25 minute mark is certainly relevant. It's 15% more experience, which is 400, and 30% more gold, which is 360. So while the potential minion value sacrificed by your team is maybe slightly lower in the early game, you're also generating more potential golden experience for the opposing team for those sub-25 minute inhibitor kills. So let's quickly recap the maximum cost of killing an inhibitor. The fear is that your team isn't able to step up and farm that pushed wave, and as a result, you lose out on those eight waves of farm that your opponents get to take safely. In short, someone could catch up to the tune of 56 CS. Now, in reality, they're probably not going to farm perfectly, and you're likely to pick up something from that side of the map, but... The outer boundary is this much. If you're getting absolutely nothing out of a raised inhibitor, you're forfeiting 8 minion waves, totaling 1560 gold, and 3128 experience to the opposing team. Of course, we are expected to gain something as a result of this map pressure. After all, someone's got to sit in their base and farm those minions, and your team can accomplish something in the 5v4. If we assume a slain inhibitor provides the maximum which is four minutes of perfect map control and neutral objectives and everything else under the sun, we can do some more digging. We can poach the opposing jungle, we can secure epic monsters, and we can destroy enemy turrets, all of which give us great value. So first, the jungle. Buffs respawn every five minutes, non-buff camps respawn every two minutes, 15 seconds, and scuttle cab respawns every two minutes, 30. Just as cannon minions grow in value over the course of the game, so do jungle camps. The amount of experience they grant grows by 20 to 25% by level 9, where their rewards plateau. Scuttle Crab also scales in gold value in addition to XP with some similar limitations. As level 9 comes well before any reasonable inhibitor kill, we're using the maximum values for all jungle camps for this consideration. Now, I've taken the full rewards of every possible jungle camp into consideration here, including the XP from jungle items. Let's assume the downed inhibitor allows you to freely farm all the camps and possible scuttle crabs on that side of the map. Averaging out 4 minutes against the respawn timers, if we're looking at a jungle quadrant providing an expected value of about 500 gold and 1150 experience, or about 35% of the value of that lane. Now, but wait, our extreme case for the minions was one team getting everything from that lane and the other team getting nothing. AKA farming three lanes versus farming two lanes. Our reasonable extreme for the jungle is our team getting three quadrants and the other team getting one, right? It's so that's that's what we're measuring here. So this three to one measure, and, and by the way, also assuming both scuttles because of map control, um, this three to one measure is now a 1000 gold and 2300 experience difference or 70% of the total value of that ignored minion wave. Now, of course, it is just unrealistic for the enemy team to get perfect CS and for your team to get nothing. It is also unrealistic to perfectly take all their camps without dropping anything on your side. We'll talk about these limitations later. I'm really not trying to argue the exact practical gains in any of these sort of slides. I'm more penciling in the outer boundaries of what is possible. 
the losses you might sustain from destroying an inhibitor and losing access to that lane are brought back about 70% from efficiently claiming that jungle quadrant over there. So far, this isn't enough by itself. Next, there's Baron Nasher. I made a tweet on August 4th asking people which team got more gold and experience. 10 waves of super minions, or just Baron Nasher with nothing resulting from the buff. Now, for some reason, a large swath of the population didn't learn reading comprehension, so people started talking about how it depended on which champions were in play, or what kind of dragon soul was on the map, and that just was not the question. Who gains more gold and experience? Now, the tweet said 10 waves. That was a bit pessimistic. The real number should be 8 waves from the 8 super minions. We don't yet care about what can be done with the buff. We're just comparing gold and experience gain from the waves to the golden experience gain from killing Baron. So, which is it? Write down your answer and see how it compares to reality. I find that most people heavily undervalue simply slaying Baron Nasher. It's worth 1,525 gold, which is 25 for the last hit, and 300 to each player on your team. Experience is 600 to every teammate, plus an additional boost of 800 local experience spread equally, totaling 3,800. So, there's the answer. Simply killing Baron Nasher is worth about 2% less gold and 20% more experience than 8 free-farmed waves. In short, Baron is better. The buff itself lasts 3 minutes, providing roughly 4 to 16,000 gold worth of attack damage and ability power to your team, which is an incredibly misleading number. It should be valued far, far lower. The more important part is that it, take, it makes minions tankier and much better at sieging turrets, which we'll get to next. So let's talk about the siege. We don't have to assume that Baron is an immutable right just from taking an inhibitor, but we can look at what our expected gains are for killing turrets, Baron or not. Even without a Baron buff, we can expect to pressure the other lanes in the 5v4. So what are those turrets worth? Well, pop quiz, again, rank them. Outer turrets, inner turrets, inhibitor turrets, and nexus turrets. We are post-inhibitor kill, so we clearly don't have turret plates or first turret gold to contend with, but maybe there's still an outer turret somewhere else to kill. Outer turrets are worth 500 total gold, half spread globally, and the other half shared locally. Tier 2 turrets, and in fact every single turret on the map, has that same 250 global share, but the local gold depends on the location. Mid lane tier 2 has 300 local gold, and the side lanes have 550 local gold. So the average tier 2 turret is worth a bit over 700 gold each. Inhibitor turrets have a paltry 50 local gold, meaning a total price of 300, and the late game kills of Nexus turrets have no local gold, meaning just the global 250. So the answer is tier 2, greater than tier 1, greater than tier 3, greater than Nexus turrets. Using realistic scenarios, we're looking at just over 500 gold per turret kill for the average in the mid to late game stage. So how many turrets do we kill thanks to the average down inhibitor? Maybe it's two? Maybe it's more with Baron? It honestly is hard to say. In a previous video I made around the value of experience, I put mid to late game XP as worth 0.5 gold for each point, so half to one. Um, with that conversation, uh, or sorry, with that conversion, uh, each turret taken walks back about one-sixth of the potential loss from sacrificing that lane's farm for four minutes. By this rule of thumb, Taking six turrets is almost worth exactly eight super mini waves, and this is kind of hand wavy. Yeah, it is, but it's also fairly accurate and good enough for this kind of analysis. Next, we have dragons. Delving super deeply into the real value of each dragon buff and how to perfectly quantify each one is probably the subject of another video. Trust me that this can go really deep if we want to do it properly. In simplified terms, we're looking at two to three hundred experience and a bit over 400 gold worth of stats for a drake, and about 3,000 gold worth for the soul. Uh, there's a lot of logic and reason going into these numbers at the end of the day. For now, you'll just have to trust me that we're at least really close. This means that taking a dragon is sort of 500 gold worth of value if you roll in the XP, and is thus about one-sixth of the inhibitor wave's value. Um, while taking a fourth dragon, including Soul, ranks up even above Baron Nasher at 3,550 gold worth of value, and, uh, well, 114% of what the enemy team is gaining from those eight minion waves. Again, broad strokes here. Let's dive a bit deeper into how much we can really apply these numbers. First, are we really giving up 1,560 gold and 3128 experience? Honestly, it depends. 
We neither expect perfect CS from our opponent, nor do we expect to get literally nothing ourselves. After all, our enemies may push the wave out and an ally can collect it, push it back and get back to the team. So the total gold gain isn't quite so rough and the total gold XP from your side isn't actually zero. It's up to you to decide how much to mentally walk back. Additionally, experience's value changes. A basic guideline is, again, that after mid-game, one point of XP is worth roughly half a point of gold, which means we can compare the inhibitor's gold and XP gains to the gold-only rewards of a turret, or the almost stat-only gains of a dragon. We can do that reasonably well. However, Kale or Cassidy it may value that experience much more highly than Jinx or Syndra, which changes the risk of that downed inhibitor. On top of that, experience gains themselves fluctuate. A solo champion only gains 93% of the experience that minions provide, The while multiple champions sharing experience get a 116% split among them. That's a pretty minor factor, but it shifts the numbers a few percent. Second, what about the jungle? I used expected value to smooth over respawn times, meaning I used four-fifths of a red or blue buff and 1.8 copies of each other jungle camp. Plus, Krugs are worth more than any other camp, so the quadrant you take changes the math slightly. These are all pretty minor differences, but they're worth keeping in mind. And again, you should be mentally fudging some of these numbers anyway. You might get a full red, you might get two Krugs, you might only get one. How applicable even is the jungle poaching, though? It can be hard to farm three quadrants reliably while keeping up with everything else, like dragon, baron, and turret sieges. Going through all of your camps and scuttles at light speed still takes about 45 seconds uh, for two quadrants, even with a full build, or more depending on the jungler. Now keep in mind, the opposing jungler um, has a lot of free time. They've cleared their one camp, and the Ally Master Yi is still killing Krugs, which is, well, not any different from the enemy Kennen killing supers inside their base. We're just 4v4, and Kennen's getting more for his time. Of course, any allied, ch any, any allied champion could take those camps, and that's totally reasonable. You just have to discount the value of that camp by about 12% for the 50 missing experience through the lack of a jungle item. Now, third, this pushes us into the epic monster discussion. If killing an inhibitor gives you Baron, it's instantly worth it, no questions asked. You've not only uh, made up all of the golden experience potentially lost, but you also get 2-3 to three minutes to push into the enemy base for a siege. If a 5v4 siege was already easy, it's even better with buffed up minions. But of course, not every inhibitor kill guarantees Baron, and you don't always need an inhibitor to secure it. Snagging an elemental drake is probably a freebie, but if it's not soul, it's not too valuable. So here's my conclusion on whether or not killing an inhibitor is worth it. Later into the game, absolutely. I put the basic benchmark at 20 to 25 minutes based on comp. Your team needs a credible threat on Baron or a dragon soul. If your only reward is poaching a full jungle quadrant perfectly and snagging a dragon, it's not as good as playing. Uh, it's not as good as the lane farm potentially lost. If you add a turret or two, it gets pretty close. But I still suggest playing the game out with a normal map state. But if that inhibitor pressure is likely to get you barren, then it's the right play. Dragons aren't incredibly exciting until they turn into soul, meaning the best early game play is actually just cashing in on winning lanes through dives and turrets. This is the typical behavior of early game focused pro teams. Sacrifice dragons and snowball an unwinnable answer, an unwinnable gold lead, through turret dives instead. The logic holds up with mid-game inhibitors and dragons as well. As one last thought, if your team is able to play all three lanes anyway and get the lion's share of the farm regardless, then that's going to look good no matter what. But it can be really difficult, especially early on with weak sight stones and low movement speed because you haven't all gotten upgraded boots yet. This reinforces the idea that an early inhibitor kill is a weakness, not a strength. Thanks for watching, and don't forget the LCS. Like, comment, and subscribe.